So today I'm uh, going to talk about crizotinib. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's a, as we talk about going back to gefitinib, um, when you use a drug for a long time, it's relatively non-toxic. People love it. And it's hard to get, it's hard to go away from it. And so um, just, I want to start out, I don't have a case in my slides, but I want to start out with just um, a kind of typical type of patient. Um, so this is a 55-year-old uh, male who uh, had uh, ALK positive lung cancer um, defined early on in the, in the course of uh, these trials and uh, actually couldn't go on to crizotinib because his, uh, his study uh, fish was non-diagnostic and so he couldn't get onto the trial. He actually went on to uh, a uh, HSP-90 inhibitor and had a four-year response to an HSP-90 inhibitor, which was pretty impressive. And we, that's something we didn't talk about here. Um, so he went on an HSP-90 inhibitor, finally progressed subtly and got really tired of getting weekly um, uh, therapy, <laughs> uh, IV therapy, and without you can't have a central line with the, with the drug. And so he was kind of done with it and started to slowly progress. So we started on crizotinib, which he's now been on for another two years and, um, and, and doing well. And, uh, you know, the scenario to think about um, is it, he has one adrenal nodule. There's been a few millimeter growth. But if that grew, would you do SRS to that lesion and keep him on, on crizotinib? Um, and so I think there are specific types of ways that we keep people on crizotinib. And Alice has described many patients who have, have been on crizotinib for long, long periods of time, part of the original trial. Um, and so throwing away crizotinib and, and uh, having this great benefit from a relatively non-toxic drug um, should be, should, we, we should consider the benefits of, of crizotinib in these patients and continuing it in the first-line therapy. So the question is, would you use, uh, what do you use in the first-line therapy setting, crizotinib? or seritinib, and I think when you talk about seritinib, you're thinking about potentially other uh, TKIs that are coming out, um, and not necessarily just seritinib, because I think there are some specific differences. So crizotinib is first-line therapy. So where we have the most data in the ALK setting is with crizotinib. And um, again, most of this um, is work from Alice and her group. Um, but just recently published is the, is the frontline versus chemotherapy, crizotinib versus chemotherapy, significant improvement in progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.45, um, much better than chemotherapy for patients with ALK-positive disease. This was, it had a crossover, and so the survival benefit is not seen, but patients then were able to receive crizotinib after chemotherapy. And I think that um, we, have to, we, we also have to think about chemotherapy in these patients because this is something that does help prolong their survival. And uh, patients um, benefit from crizotinib even after they've received chemotherapy and progressed. And so pretty impressive results and uh, by far the, most, uh, the highest level of evidence that we have for ALK-positive patients. When we look about, at, at the benefit, the benefit is in all subgroups basically across the board. Patients with locally advanced were a very small, small subset, and that's a different conversation uh, that Govindan brought up earlier. Um, the, the use of these uh, TKIs really needs to be studied. But everybody else had a benefit to uh, receiving crizotinib over chemotherapy. <clears throat> then moving along to um, the data that's out there in crizotinib naive versus crizotinib resistant, and most of the data that are for second-generation TKIs are not from randomized trials. They're from um, generally phase one trials that are just uh, continuing to accrue. So the numbers are, are hard to completely um, nail down. But what we see here, um, so again, the crizotinib naive, the randomized trial um, from, from Solomon is uh, 10 months, 10.9 months versus seven months. Um, and overall survival was similar in both groups. Um, as, far as, sec as far as second line, um, we have 7.7 months versus three months, and again, overall survival uh, was a wash with the crossover. When you look at seritinib, um, so again, the, the progression-free survival continues to um, get longer for the uh, crizotinib naive patients. These are, this is a, a small uh, population, and so um, we're waiting for some of the results from the other trials to help define this, but uh, potentially quite long in these patients. And then for crizotinib resistance, we're looking around seven months. 
for electinib, um, again, in the front line, um, we, that's a moving target. It continues to get longer. Um, a majority of these patients who got it in the first line are um, the Asian population. And uh, as Dr. Guerin talked about, there's a lot of differences when you do heavily, when you treat heavily uh, Asian populations and survival. I don't know that you can um, completely ca compare across the board, but they are impressive in the frontline setting and about nine months in the second line setting. And then as far as uh, brigatinib, which is AP26113, um, again, in the phase one study setting, um, too early to look at uh, the crizotinib naive, the progression-free survival has is, is not been reached, but has a pr impressive um, uh, progression-free survival um, so far in the phase one study, phase one two study um, of 13.4 uh, months. So these drugs definitely have benefits and are more potent ALK inhibitors. Um, but what we do know is that they work after crizotinib. What we don't know, um, and so here's, here's the data for these drugs after crizotinib. So seritinib um, works incredibly well, what we see from the waterfall plot. The majority of the patients were post crizotinib and the benefit is there um, as far as responses, whether they've re received crizotinib or not. So significant benefit. Brugatinib also, um, significant benefit, and most of these patients have received crizotinib, and so um, the post-crizotinib benefit is there. Um, this is uh, the electinib, also significant improvement post-crizotinib. What we don't know is um, whether crizotinib can benefit post these drugs, and I think because it's, I, I, I think there might maybe reasons why um, it, it, it would, it's not as potent of an inhibitor, so it potentially wouldn't um, overcome most of the resistance in some sets, subsets of resistance. And um, Alice has discussed so eloquently how complex the resistance is, maybe that uh, crizotinib could be used in some of these patients. But obviously, it, it, it's been studied much less than these uh, second generation inhibitors. Then we talk about to to toxicity. And crizotinib is really quite well. Uh, tolerated, and this is versus chemotherapy, but when you look at grade three, grade four toxicities, really the most prominent is uh, elevated liver function tests, and generally uh, the drug can be dose reduced, and that can be tolerated. And so they're very minimal as far as significant toxicities, and the day in and day out use of this drug is, is very, very well tolerated. Seritinib, on the other hand, is poorly tolerated, and I, and again, Alice spoke to this in, in detail, um, but in general, um, at the 750 dose, which is the approved dose, um, I haven't met a patient who can tolerate that for I, not even more than a few weeks. Um, most of my patients uh, can, just cannot tolerate it. And you wanna keep a patient on these drugs. You don't wanna be dose reducing, stopping them, trying to get them uh, to recover from their toxicities. And so to me, getting to the right dose, getting, on the, getting them on the drug and keeping them on it is an important thing. And that's a difficult thing with seritinib. And uh, definitely even with food, um, it still has GI toxicities um, that at least um, our patients have experienced. Um, so again, I think at the highest doses of 600 and 750, it's still pretty hard to tolerate. And as you see, um, as far as um, adverse events at the, at the uh, 750 dose, the majority of patients have had, had adverse events. And actually most patients had to dose reduce um, from the 750 dose. So what matters, and this, is, this has been discussed for all of these inhibitors as we start to move along the line, and this is starting to look like uh, renal cell carcinoma, where you have multiple inhibitors and you're trying to find a way to sequence them to give the patients the longest and best life possible. And, um, and again, I think that we cannot ignore chemotherapy and especially pemetrexid-based chemotherapy. Um, and again, there's, there's kind of a small series of reports that d demonstrate benefit of pemetrexid in these patients. Um, and I don't know that it's ALK specific, but um, these patients can have significant benefit. I've had patients on two years of pemetrexid. And often, um, especially compared to, to some of the chronic toxicities of taking an oral drug, pemetrexid can be pretty well tolerated over time. And so we can't, we can't forget about chemotherapy when we're, um, when we're talking about how we're gonna prolong their survival. And I don't know, I'd, talking to, I'd like to get Alice's viewpoint on where you would put chemotherapy and potentially whether you could gain some sensitivity back 
um, in, these resistant, uh, in these resistant patients if you use chemotherapy kind of in between some of the sequencing of the second generation or third generation TKIs. And so right now what we have is crizotinib uh, 10 months, seritinib others maybe 7 to 13 months, so we're gaining kind of to tw about 20 months there. And then chemotherapy 4 months, maybe longer because they, they're chemotherapy naive, so I, I put down 4 months as a, as a, um, as a benchmark for patient from the, um, from the second line trial, but that, that actually may be longer for the chemotherapy naive population. Um, and then if you use seritinib as, or other, another second generation, um, 10 to 13 months, potentially getting into the 20 months, but um, I think when we go into phase three trials, um, generally those numbers are a little bit lower, so I, I, I was a little conservative. Crizotinib, are we gonna benefit? We're not really sure, but I think it would likely be short um, if patients receive crizotinib, um, and then adding on the chemotherapy. Starting with crizotinib, getting seritinib, what about immunotherapy? What about chemotherapy? And what about sequencing these? Um, and again, I think at this point, using crizotinib, a second generation inhibitor, potentially chemotherapy to give, um, to try and uh, get rid of some of those resistant clones, and then potentially another second or third generation ALK inhibitor um, is kind of what I like. And it's about, again, giving patients the longest, best life that they can have. And, um, and I think we have a lot of options for patients with, uh, with ALK translocated uh, disease. And, uh, and, that, and that's really changed over the last two years for us. Um, and then again, going to the master protocol, um, I think that's what we need to know how to sequence this. And we need to understand what happens if they use it first line and then they cross over to receive other. We're never going to get to all of these drugs in the right sequence, but I think we're going to get to a better understanding about how to prolong patient survival. And, um, and then also, as far as chemotherapy, this is being studied in SWOG. I got these um, from Ross Kamage, um, and so this is a SWOG's 1300 tri trial. I don't think that the amendment is gone through yet, but this is allowing for platinum, uh, platinum-based doublets post um, crizotinib and second generation TKI, and then they actually go back to reinitiate re crizotinib, and again, the argument may be that it might not be crizotinib that's the best drug in that setting, but at least we're trying to look at um, chemotherapy sequenced into this also, which I think is also incredibly important for these patients. So I think there's a, a lot of rationale to use um, crizotinib in the first line. It's the, it's, it's, it's the highest level of evidence that we have for our patients at this time. It's very well tolerated and significantly less toxic, toxic than uh, seritinib. Um, sequencing agents, this is what we're going to be doing for our patients. And it's really a great time for patients with ALK positive lung cancer. Um, and I think the, the one place, I, I hope that my patients with ALK disease, we can avoid whole brain radiation, hopefully altogether. But because these, these second generation uh, inhibitors go to the brain so well, um, the place where I would, uh, would, would avoid uh, crizotinib in the first line would be patients with uh, with multiple brain meds that would otherwise require whole brain radiation. Um, but otherwise, I think crizotinib is still the best drug in this setting. 